thing that bonded all of his films was the incredible virtuoso that he was with craft. He was always on the cutting edge technically. And 2001's probably the best demonstration of his cutting edge knowledge. It's become clear that this is one of the seminal American movies. It was a battle cry for a generation. Everybody that I know now that, that has gone on to get awards and, and accolades were at that time just kids just starting out. And 2001 was the picture that just ignited the spark. To see somebody actually do it, to make a visual film, was hugely inspirational to me. If he did it, I can do it. When 2001 first came out, I was in film school, which obviously, it had a huge impact on me. Any time a Stanley Kubrick film came out, me and most of my friends were always the first in line to go see it. You know, I remember very clearly the first day I saw 2001, it was opening day. The theater was really cold. And so when we were in space and the whole second half of the movie, I felt like I was on board the spaceship. I had no idea about the kind of trip I was gonna go on. And I went on one of the greatest trips of my life. Shivers went up and down my spine. I mean, now that is the kind of phrase that critics shouldn't use because it sounds so corny. But I, I wanna say shivers went up and down my spine. They really did. I was blown away by it, just like everybody else. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I think it was the first time people really took science fiction seriously. A lot of the, the science fiction up to that point, especially during the 50s, had been very bee-oriented, which is a giant monster, a giant ant, a giant this. Science fiction and horror films were all kind of tongue-in-cheek. It was entertaining, it was uh, engaging, but it wasn't, didn't feel significant. Adults weren't really supposed to be interested in science fiction movies. 2001 changed all that. All of a sudden, 2001 was this not only masterful film in terms of physically what it accomplished, it was also this gigantic intellect. Stanley wasn't really a, a big fan of science fiction. He thought the ideas were good, but the characterization was inevitably deplorable. He wasn't content with just making a good science fiction movie. He was Kubrick and always had to push the envelope. He would tell me the last couple years of his life when we were talking about the form, he kept saying, I want to change the form. I want to make a movie that changes the form. And I said, well, didn't you do that with 2001? He did some really groundbreaking things in that film. Stanley tried to take a basic literary work and do it visually without words. And I think he succeeded amazingly well. The first few reels of 2001 are, in a way, by definition, a silent movie. I think the first lines of dialogue come 30 minutes into the movie. It was this incredibly slow, incredibly long, you know, no dialogue for the first 30 minutes, and when the dialogue came, it was all kind of spoken quietly, and it didn't seem to make much kind of sense. Let's see, last June? Yeah, about eight months. Mm -hmm. I suppose you saw the work on the new section when you came in. Hey, it's along great. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's extremely subtle, and it's extremely visual, and, and the story is, you know, just sort of razor thin. If you were proven to be malfunctioning, I wouldn't see how we'd have any choice but disconnection. The way he told stories was sometimes antithetical to the way we are accustomed to receiving stories.
This was a film that was imprinted on the consciousness of everyone who saw it and forced them to talk about it and, more importantly, to think about it. Every viewer has to make up their own mind about what the film is about. They have to make their own connections. The mystery of the obelisk was incredibly provocative. The essential reason is not possible to comprehend intellectually. It is much better to, to leave the end of 2001 and the whole story, in fact, as it stands, unexplained, as a bow to the unknowable. All of us had hours of putting our feet up on somebody's couch and going, OK, what did this mean and what is this really? I mean, it's one of the most thought-provoking movies ever made. And no, I don't know what it meant, but just having a movie that I enjoyed that much, even without knowing what the thrust of it was, um, was... I said, wow, somebody simply took their time to tell a story, and it's a very subtle story. And when you present a film like that, and you're a good filmmaker, you can really draw an audience in, because they have to pay attention. Those slow parts were absolutely essential to the, the whole feeling of just being in space. It starts getting really interesting and uncomfortable, and, and not in a classical way at all, in a very sub-soul way that only, I guess, he knew how to do. I think it's so far ahead of its time in terms of the way it tells a story and does it visually rather than verbally. It's a silent movie in the sound era, and I think we will get back there. 2001 was the beginning of a, a, a genuine revolution of visual effects. In terms of traditional special effects, it is the pinnacle. You go through you know, the first 70 years, and that is the, the best of the best of special effects movies, and it'll always be. 2001 is the biggest quantum leap in convincing realistic visual effects in the history of the medium. Nobody had put the effort into special effects like Stanley had. Stanley really reinvented the medium. When you look at it now and realize that he did it all on film, it's, it's beyond me. The special effects in 2001 were really the last flowering of photo-mechanical special effects. It was such an advanced movie for its time. I mean, still amazing to realize that some of the shots involve so much engineering. I mean, you see the entire set rotating and the camera follows and the actors have to uh, hit certain marks, otherwise they will fall down because the set rotates. That was what Kubrick did. Anything that was presented to him as a challenge or something to do, he would immediately figure out how to flip it on its head, do exactly the opposite of what everybody had ever done before. For the control room of the Discovery, they actually built a centrifuge I mean, this thing was bigger than a house. But what better way to simulate the revolving centrifuge of a spaceship than to build one full size and revolve it, you know, <laughs> and let it turn 360 degrees? And it's masterful. It's probably hard for anyone under the age of 20 to believe that we didn't have computers back in the 60s. But I don't think he would have done it any other way. Even if he had t digital technology like we have today, I don't think he would have changed it in terms of the way the film looked. They were doing then what we're doing now. So it was really looking forward, and that's why the stuff was seamless. There were sequences in it that were, I couldn't figure out how he could have done, done it. I mean, they were truly uh, so ex amazingly inventive. And he, he was fascinated with being on the leading edge all of the time. Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. Science fiction films that came before it were all physically crude. The model work in, in 2001, the, the spaceships were, were light years ahead of what anybody had done you know, previously. 
Spacecraft in science fiction films prior to 2001 were generally smooth and shiny and very sleek looking. You either had your flying saucers, which were pretty much based on, I think, something that somebody saw in 1947 in the desert and said it was a saucer. The ships in 2001 resembled more of what you would see at NASA at the time. They were designed by engineers, not by people in a Hollywood prop shop. This was unprecedented. You always brought in some hack Hollywood art director. They need to shoot it tomorrow and we'll glue this stuff on and, you know, sparks will come out of it. That was a new vision for spacecraft. And of course, that vision affected Star Wars. Star Wars, uh, all the spaceships, again, are built out of bits of, uh, of airfix kits. And they would uh, construct a, a spaceship like the um, Millennium Falcon. And got model kits and just put little wibbly things on. It didn't matter what it was. And they would just grab wheels and treads and pipes and stick them all over it. They take that leftover part, cut it up, stick it on there, and your mind will say, hey, that's something that uh, I don't understand what it is, but it must be functional. 2001 changed the viewer's expectations in terms of what science fiction movies should look like. George Lucas's movies had to be better in terms of, in terms of the invention, the technological invention. The stakes in the game had just been raised, I mean, tremendously. Eventually, everybody had to rise to the challenge. I'm not sure at that point I would have had the guts to do what Stanley did. I don't know whether I, I'm trying to get up the the fortitude to do something like what he did. Kubrick's eye was faultless, and, and it's all about the eye, that film. It celebrated the beauty of space travel, and the beauty of design, and the beauty of motion. The whole idea of that movie is that space and space travel is exquisite. It's the most hypnotic movie I've ever seen. You really kind of sit there and start to watch it and start to kind of go like this, and then your head starts to go like this. As Kubrick said, I want this film to succeed not on the level of cinema, but on the level of music. And it is, it's, it's music, it's an opera. It's like watching a sunset. The whole movie is like watching a sunset. All the shots are very long and very slow and very musical and very, you know, you get to see everything. I think Kubrick knew more about music and how to use it in the film than almost anybody I've ever seen. My youngest son is a school teacher and, and he played the Blue Danube Waltz to his class. And uh, some of the boys got up and, and waved their arms and ran through the classroom and said, oh, it's the space music. Yeah? I think Johann Strauss would have been most surprised. <laughs> you can't go a week without being reminded of it. You can turn on Turner Classics and see one of the astronauts being interviewed and talking now about how NASA will wake them up every morning by playing the Blue Danube. The craft is impeccable. Every film he's ever made, the craft is impeccable. The lighting, the dolly shots, there's the compositions. I mean, the exact compositions. You had to hit your mark precisely to please Stanley so he'd get his painting, the painting he was putting on canvas for you. It's as though his reputation hangs on every take or every shot, and so you, he never lets down. I feel much better now. I really do. I think that the factor that made everything convincing in 2001 was extreme quality control exerted by Stanley Kubrick himself. Stanley had a real respect for sound and the impact that sound could have on a movie. Most films today are very busy with sound. There's dialogue constantly. There's music that's very dense with a big orchestra. 2001 is really at the opposite end of that kind of style, where you kind of have one sound at a time. For example, wonderful sequences in the film where you just hear the breathing astronaut. You just get the, the that breathing. And that breathing is like music.
Kubrick was one of the first directors to really go for the utmost in realism. Stanley's um, research was exhaustive on everything. I mean, it was unending. Everything had to be so palpably believable that you, you, there was no margin for error. It couldn't be fanciful at all in any way. Nothing from that movie felt artificial. It felt organic. It felt that the characters are actually um, in space. Attention to the physics of his world. In other words, things that were massive moved in a way that was appropriate to physics. If you go to space, there's no gravity. But in all the space movies before then, people walked around in the ships, and they still do. Star Wars, people stand up in the ships, and the ships do loop-de-loops, and nobody's hanging onto a handle. You know, you'd, you'd fly against the ceiling, you'd hit the windshield. Kubrick made space both um, awesome and matter-of-fact. What was great about the film is that Kubrick treats it like a commuter going to work. Floyd is always asleep. He's never looking out the window, you know, when he's going to the moon. They weren't trying to convince me this was happening. They were showing me what it was like. It looks credible now. And, you know, once you're in the movie, you forget that this future hasn't happened yet. You forget that, that 2001 has been and gone, but the future hasn't happened yet. The business of uh, the vacuum of space, him opening one hatch and having it blow him through another hatch. I mean, that's great physics. One of my favorite moments is when astronaut Bowman ejects himself from the pod. And of course, it builds up with, with all the sounds inside his little pod, the little whir of electronics and some alarms and things are going. And you expect that at the moment it explodes, you're gonna have a big explosion, maybe a crescendo of music or something. But what happens is it goes to silence. It's a breathtaking moment because what you expected didn't happen, you were surprised, but you realize instantly that it was the proper thing to happen, that it was the way things were in space. Oh, I think 2001 was a very influential film to to all the filmmakers who got fascinated with special effects. Of course, Spielberg was influenced by 2001, and I would think that Robert Zemeckis's contact perhaps owes a greater debt to 2001. The Stargate sequence, although it's probably not called that, of the original Star Trek The Motion Picture, which came a decade after 2001, uses the same kind of slit scan technique. 2001 is, is, is the grandfather of all such films. You know that, you know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, you know, were sitting in the theater a few years older than us just going, oh, I get it. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like being touched with a lightning rod. The reason I think I got involved in film is because of Stanley Kubrick. I think he's the most important filmmaker that we've ever had. Other more successful directors, but he is the most important director in my lifetime as I see it. Well, the thing about Stanley is I think that he's a filmmaker's filmmaker. I mean, I think he's one of those guys that if you start studying film, you start learning about film and try to make film, you begin to look at his work and you just stand in awe. The best in history. Nobody could shoot a movie better than Stanley Kubrick in history. Of all the American directors of the generation that was just ahead of mine, Stanley was the best. No, he's... There are filmmakers, and then there are that select and very rarefied group of people who could all fit in a Volkswagen, who when they make a film, anybody who makes film, anybody who loves film, you go to see it. Solely because their name's on it. Kubrick was head of that list. I would think almost every science fiction film owes a debt of gratitude to 2001 in some way. I think it's one of the three or four most influential films ever made and continues to be. It's still a masterpiece. 
And every science fiction film that's followed it is a part of its heritage. <laughs>